Hello, uh, good afternoon, and um, uh, I'm glad that you decided to actually come here for, for the last talk of the day. Um, so, yeah, the talk is OSGI for Outsiders, as strange as it sounds. Um, and if you want to comment about it, um, and let me know how bad or good it was. You can just uh, tweet me by the Twitter handle down there. Um, so, I work for a company called LifeRay. And for those of you who are not familiar with LifeRay, uh, it's historically a portal, and we've shifted now to being more of a like a services uh, platform. Uh, and and because of that, it's heavily based on OSGI. Like everything now is OSGI services. We do some magic with it. It's pretty big, as you can see. We do we still ship it as a one platform, but we do have a lot of services. But the reason. I'm showing you this is not to advertise the product, but to actually tell you that I've been doing OSGI stuff for quite some time. Um, and um, actually, I started doing OSGI a long, long time ago. Then I give up. I was like, that, that technology is like not working. And, uh, and then I'm now again doing OSGI for the last, I don't know, four or five years. Um, and this is like uh, one, oh, well, by the way, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is, um, I typically don't put like safe harbor statements in my presentations, uh, and I kind of felt I have to do it this time, and um, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you will see why. <laughs> uh, anyway, I mean, I've been with OSGI for a while, and um, I have some strong opinions about it. Um, first of all, let me uh, do, I, I assume you're all familiar with OSGI, right? Uh, is there anyone who is like here to learn what OSGI is? Uh, okay, so um, <laughs> that's <laughs> uh, okay. So I was thinking, like my thinking goes more like, okay, there's going to be only OSGI people, so message is a little bit targeted differently. But okay, glad we have outsiders, and uh, they may learn something as well. Um, okay, but, but by the way, the rest of you, I'm not quite sure, so I'm going to do a real quick, uh, a real quick quiz here. So you are familiar with OSGI? Those are the specs. Um, are they, as they were released in years. Now, the question for you is, in which OSGI release the HTTP service was first specified? Okay, Go, who goes for R6? R5? Hands up. R4? R3? R1? 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 Yeah, you're right, it's R1. It's actually the first release of OSGI that specifies the HTTP service. I was quite surprised to learn that myself. I was like, oh, I'm just going to do this quiz to actually check things out. But what I was actually looking for when I found this interesting fact is uh, some old stuff about OSGI, like the origins of OSGI. And I found three really interesting presentations from back in 2004. Uh, which describes like what OSGI is. And if you look into it, like, hey, those are the releases, and we go from home automation, or, you know, the way to server sites, it looks pretty cool. Well, it also has a very interesting um, thing about uh, what it is. Developing remotely deployed service applications. It kind of sounds like, you know, you could use this statement today to describe some other technologies. Um, but that's not the most interesting part. The most, one of the most interesting parts I find here is it is a just like an operating system for networked services. Uh, that, that, again, that's 2004. It's so cool. Uh, and you know, also, the, the most important thing I found in this slide is uh, where it is access to tens of thousands of software libraries. And that's, again, 2004. Um, and then we start learning how to do OSGI, and that's one tutorial that I found back from roughly that time that that's just a table of contents of the tutorial. And if you closely examine some parts of it, it basically says create a manifest file, create an act, uh, activator, update the manifest file, do something else, update the manifest file. And so basically you're beginning a lot with like dealing with manifest files back in, 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 in 2004. Well, more uh, good things happened after that, like tools like BND showed up, made life a lot easier. So you would assume that it would be like, you know, the ever advancing technology. Fast forward 2010, and we get statements like this. It's the most widely acclaimed technology that nobody is using. And that makes you wonder what, what, what happened. Fast forward 2015, and you have the Thoughtworks technology, rather, stating that 
actually it adds its own accidental complexity and you shouldn't be using OSGI because it's like, yeah, it, it, it's uh, whatever they say on, on hold. Okay, and if you do things like Google Trends, for example, well, right now at 2016, we are at about 25% of the, um, the highest peak, which was back in whatever, 2005. I don't know, I don't see the, the years uh, from here. So, going through all this makes you wonder this question. Why outsiders don't see the beauty of OSGI? I mean, we do OSGI, we know it's great, we know it's super cool technology, and there seems to be people out there that do not appreciate that fact. So I kind of went through um, uh, some psychological research, and I found that the assumption number one we're making <coughs> with is their ignorance. They don't have the data. That's what we think of them, right? I mean, we know it is great, we know it's cool, and, and they don't appreciate it, so they must have the wrong information. So we start teaching them, and we start discussing with, with, with these people and, and telling them how great OSGI is, and they still don't get it. So we go to the second assumption. They're idiots. <laughs> right? I mean, come on, we gave you all the information. It's right here, and you should be saying, oh, thank you, mister, and you're still arguing with me? Uh, I mean, like, yeah, they're idiots. But then it turns out that actually you are talking to quite smart people. Uh, you know, they didn't, doesn't, you know, in all these other areas, they don't look like idiots. So here goes assumption number three. They're just evil. You know, they understand, but they have their own means or their competitors or, or they do something that, you know, is just going to hurt them and so they're going to do anything to destroy it. And um, yeah. Yeah, those were not defined by me, by the way. It's a great talk by Katrin Schultz. If you watch TED, you can watch it. It's called On Being Wrong. Um, <clears throat> so um, one important thing here is, though, what these other guys think about us. What they think about us, people that favor OSGI. Well, guess what? They think the exact same thing. <laughs> um, and actually, there is a quite interesting research done by Henry Teufel. Uh, many, many years ago, I think it was like 53, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, who actually did this experiment. He got a bunch of students, separated them into two groups, and started showing them random paintings. Okay? And half of the paintings were by uh, a Kandansky, and half were by a painter called Klee. So what he did later on is he randomly, totally randomly, assigned people to groups. So I say, your preferences are for Kandansky and your preferences are for Klee, regardless of what they were answering. So these people were told that based on that experiment, they belong to this group. And later on, they were asked to do things like give point, give actually distribute a certain amount of money between the participants of the uh, experiment. And you would realize that people were defending their own group. Even though they don't belong there, they were just randomly put there. But because they were in a group, they belonged to a group, they felt they need to defend that group to the point that actually they would give less money to the members of their own group as long as the members of the other group don't get any. Right? So, so, so that, that is how, uh, how that psychological uh, effect works. And if you shift that to OSGI versus non-OSGI people, that's how we see things. Well, we see things like reduced complexity and model architecture and all these cool, great things about OSGI. And what they see is complexity. Well, uh, uh, some crazy non-standard build tools, uh, awkward design, and, and so forth. And why that happens is partly because of bias that is known as a uh, continued influence effect, which basically means once you learn something, uh, even though later on it's proven, you're proven to be wrong, you keep kind of enforcing yourself into believing that. And because we had this period of time where OSGI was really complex and you really had to, to, to put a lot of effort into building some stuff, we're kind of dealing with a continued influence effect right now. People still thinking uh, that this technology, it's, it's very complex, it's very hard, and it has a lot of overhead. And I'm speaking to you as someone who actually loves OSGI. Well, the warning here is it works both ways. We are ourselves biased. We are ourselves in, in, a, in a, like we see tools, we see stuff going on, and we think like, oh, it's so great. 
So, so the truth is, as always, somewhere in between. This is a recent discussion that happened just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, and someone was saying, uh, he was arguing with Christian, actually. Uh, he was saying that uh, the, about the complexity, uh, no, sorry, the overhead of, of OSGI. So when I heard the, over, the word overhead, I jumped right in and I was like, hey, wait a minute, what do you mean by overhead? Because I actually do another presentation where I do compare OSGI with like Spring Boot and I use tools, uh, JVM tools to actually prove that OSGI is much more lightweight than the Spring Boot. Uh, and I, I just show him uh, like the, the recording um, and he goes, no, 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 I don't mean runtime. I mean uh, uh, build time with uh, like, uh, the tools and everything. And the discussion goes, it's like, like what, they, what tools they are using. So they express overhead as uh, like the tools are not there, uh, and it's actually in general kind of hard to build OSGI applications, which we know it's not the truth. We know we created a bunch of useful tools over the last couple of years, but hey, it, they, they, they still believe like, OSGI is hard. I did a survey a couple of months ago uh, it was called Developers About OSGI. Um, it's online, you can find it if you want to get the exact results. What I was interesting to find was if there is any correlation in between like, people's experience or, or people's favorite technologies or people's age or, or, or people's like, uh, source of information and what they think about OSGI. So this chart is kind of a combination of what they, uh, the colors are like, what they think about OSGI is, and down there is their experience. So it's quite interesting to see uh, the, 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 the purple line is the people that believe OSGI is worthless. It, they, they wouldn't use it uh, for, for whatever reason. <clears throat> and it's quite interesting to see that it kind of grow, uh, it, it, in here, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of high. Um, uh, higher than, uh, like for example, those that think it's a deployment uh, architecture. But it's, it's one thing that actually should bother you in this, in this uh, graph is that the most answers are in here, the people that have between 10 and 20 years of experience. And the biggest value I found from this uh, survey actually was that people in this group, two years and up and to five years of experience, they don't bother to answer at all because they don't care, they deal with totally different stuff. Um, this is what, again, um, your source of knowledge versus what you think it is. Um, the, the, the obviously, al always like the most popular option is that it's a component framework. They compare it to Spring uh, and the Java EE. Uh, that, that's what most people think OSGI is about. Um, well, interesting part is like the first answer is here is like, I use OSGI on a day-to-day -day basis. So those are people that deal with OSGI every single day. And you still have in that group people that says it's worthless. Uh, that, that, that was kind of interesting, uh, interesting finding. Um, so what is it? Why do we have these people uh, saying those things? And why, well, are they ignorant, stupid, or what? I think the answer is here. And it's basically we don't understand each other. We're talking about the two different things. Two different things. We see the world from two different perspectives, and uh, and trying to convince each other about the other person's perspective. It's kind of kind of non, kind of pointless. Um, or like in this picture. So I'd say that's OSGI and that's not OSGI. I mean, from a person who loves OSGI perspective, at least. I was like, oh, so look. I mean, how can you do this to your drawer? I mean, you should be doing this, right? And, then, and then if, you, if you don't think in a perspective that I need to do this, you would say, well, yeah, that's much cleaner, that's much better. But then it strikes you that to keep it that way, you need to be very careful every time you open your drawer and you start thinking where you put things or where you get things from. And it's like, ah, forget it, I'll just throw things in, right? Okay, and, and, and now trying to convince those people, I don't care, I mean, just throw the thing in it, I'll find it later on somehow. Okay, so let's, let's go to some um, uh, more concrete things. Like, what is, what I learned in, in the last two years trying to advocate for OSGI and various conferences, Java user groups, and a bunch of places, 
um, is that there are like three major pain points. And the first one is generally described as tooling. Uh, and people obviously mean different things with it when they say tooling, right? But they, they, I mean, a lot of them are not aware of some things. A lot of them are aware, but those are not the tools that they would like to use. Uh, and so forth. And it goes in like a, in these four categories. So the first one is the environment management, like how, what environment you need in order to create noise your applications. And here, obviously, like pretty much everyone is these days using BND in one way or another. Either that's through a, uh, like a plugin or something, but at the end of the day, you end up using more or less BND. So, but then all this context uh, of, of like workspaces and repositories and plugins and templates and JP, uh, J JPM for J and it's like, no, nah, that's not how we build Java applications, right? Um, the second thing that people complain most about is configuration and by configuration, I mean configuration of BND and configuration of, of services, properties files. I mean, come on, it's 2016, really? I mean. You know, if you look at the modern tools out there, whether you like them or not, find me one that people are so, you know, crazy about these days that uses properties files. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> I'm not gonna comment on that. So same thing goes with build. Like, uh, yeah, you may be using BND one form or another, but then, then, then there is PD and Tyco and, and Maven and Oka. I say, which one I use? And if I, if I use a combination of the two, where I put things? Do I, do I manage my stuff in Maven or do I manage my stuff in, um, in BND? I mean, if you've been around with OSGI, those are obvious things for you. You just can close your eyes and tell them, this goes here, this goes here, and it makes perfect sense. But for someone who is just trying to figure out his way to write his first Hello World OSGI application, that's not so obvious. And I don't understand them. And finally, you have things like runtime, where so once you build some stuff, how you run it. So, well, there are, there are BND run stuff uh, in, 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 in BND that can generate your executable jars. If you're using Caraf, you're probably gonna target for something like features. Or if you are uh, in a, like, I wanna be standards uh, compliant, then you're probably gonna go with like, I don't know, subsystems or something. So there are many mm -hmm. different ways. And again, you look into that, that thing, it's like, what do I do? Second thing is documentation. And now I need to point out, and Root has really improved that. Uh, uh, I mean, honestly, uh, I was very, very skeptical about it in Root when I first heard about it. I was like, this is like a crap. But I've changed my mind since then and, and, and actually went to a number of tutorials and a number of, of, of the things they publish. And it's a really great source. If you want to learn OSGI, that's probably what you should do. The problem with Enroot, I would point, it's, it, it has a too academical approach. So if you have a, if you go to, uh, like if you want to learn how to build a Spring Boot application, you go to their web page, and the first thing you have hitting your right in your eyes, it's an example. You copy paste, you're good to go. Well, it's not that Enroot doesn't have examples, it has a lot, in fact. But the first thing that you hit, is a, this very long explanation of what OSGI is, what modularity is, why it's word, and you're like, you feel like a student. It's like, oh, I don't want to read that thing. Give me the examples, right? Um, the, the, the second thing that kind of hurts us is there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of old information uh, and that is easily findable. If you do a Google search, you will find articles from 2008 and 2004 and 2010 that seem to be relevant, but they teach you the wrong things. Or, well, they weren't wrong at the time, but they're not the things that you want to do today. And for, if you don't know, it's hard for you to tell. And honestly, how many people are looking at the date when they read an article? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think the biggest missing piece here is one central place that, that is like the universal source of truth. And basically you go there and tells you if you want to run, uh, if you want to do OSGI, in, in, in like, do you have different options? Those are the scenarios. Those are the use cases. Um, and Root kind of tries to be that, but I think it's, it's, it's not there yet. And finally, what you also find, and I think that that's what personally m hurts me the most, is you start searching about things and you find um, uh, 
archives of a discussions on different mailing lists and, and forums and things like that, where people who you kind of understand they're very, very respected person, respectable persons, uh, people in, in OSGI world, they argue about things and they basically kind of point each other at stupidity and you know, you don't, you don't do uh, whatever, B and D, I'm sorry, you do something or you don't do Blueprint, you do DS, or no, 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 you don't do DS, you do iPojo. Uh, and, and then you read all those things, it's like, well, well okay, I, I'm lost. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that, okay? And, and by doing this, we're kind of hurting ourselves. And the third group of, of, of issues that kind of people uh, uh, um, bring up is strategies. So do I go, like if I want to do OSGI, do I need to do it embedded or hosted? I mean, and why I want it to be, why I want it to be embedded and why I want it to be, uh, to be hosted. Um, the second thing, and this is like a, a never-ending discussion, I think the latest uh, mail I saw in, in that area about compile time versus runtime resolution was about a month ago. People arguing, like, what's, what's better? Like, uh, do I have to run OSGI and throw my bundles and expect it that it's going to automatically resolve them at runtime? Or do I need to do all the resolution up front and then run an application which is essentially static? It doesn't change. I mean, they, obviously, there is no right and wrong. There are use cases where you would do one or another, but if you're trying to find yourself an, a, a good answer, it's, it's, it's very hard. How to handle third-party non-OSGI libraries? I think we've all been there. Uh, and um, and, I, and I, if, if there is one point from this presentation that I would say, if we fix that, it's going to move us 100 years forward, that's probably this one. Right? If we were able to somehow fix this problem, uh, that, that would be a major step forward. And um, last but not least, uh, at least with the customers I deal with, the, the ever coming up question is how you cross boundaries, how you do AOP, how you do transactions, how you do things that are not, that are like out of the scope of, of, of a bundle, right? And obviously there are some answers for that too, but none of those answers is obvious, none of those answers uh, is, is easy to find. Uh, so so this, these are the things that people have pointed out over the last two years that have either made them hate OSGI or to completely give up on it. I said, yeah, I don't really, and, and to, to, to keep claiming how complex it is. And the sad part is for most of those things, we do have solutions, right? It's just, Sometimes we have too many solutions. Um, okay, so when I was in, uh, in Netherlands a couple of years ago, the, 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 the man who landed uh, me the apartment I stayed uh, spoke four languages. And he was like an average person, no one you know, really smart. And he spoke four languages. And I was like, wow, is it, is it a common thing in, in, in Denmark, in, I'm sorry, in Netherlands that you speak four languages? He was like, well, you know what? We're a small country. And if we want to deal with, uh, with, um, with, for, with like other countries, we want to do business with them, we have to speak their languages. We, don't, we can't expect them to speak to, to learn Dutch. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's, that's really a smart way to look at the, into things. And that's what I called, and actually I think someone coined it earlier, a Dutchman's international attitude. So my point is, what we need is a noise GI inter-community attitude. Basically, we can't expect people to all of a sudden become an OSGI fans and being like, motivated to learn the thing despite all the hard part. We, would, we need to kind of acknowledge what their desires are and, uh, and, try, to, uh, and try to fix uh, the things. Why? Why we need to do that? Um, I highly recommend you to read a novel called I Pencil. It's a... Um, a novel by Leonard Reed, again, from 50-something years ago, and it, he describes a pencil as a, like he writes from a first person as being a pencil. How complicated a pencil is, and actually the statement is, there is not a single person on earth who can build a pencil, because it means you need to hoe and grow the tree, and then, you know, cut it and do the, the wood, and then you dig the graphite, and, you know, if you want to do a pencil, if you like, if you have an earth with no people on it, and someone puts you there, for you to make a pencil, it's going to be years, 
right? E assuming you have the knowledge. And the only reason we could do that is a collaborative effort, because we have people that know this and people that know that. And it's a very good example that I kind of love to show sometimes, um, for example, to my kids. Um, you have two people, let's say John and Jerry, and John can do A in four hours and B in three hours. So if he wants to have A and B done, he needs seven hours. And then you have Jerry that, has, that can do A in one hour and B in two hours, so he can do the whole thing in three hours. So looking at just that picture, basically you can say, well, pff, Jerry is like cool, he doesn't need John, right? That's, that's the obvious impression that, that you get. Well, guess what? If you get John to do two Bs, and if you get Jerry to do two As, now Jerry is done in two hours, and John is done in six hours, and then they trade. Right? So each of them saves an hour just by doing this. Okay? And, you, and the cool part is the more you're doing this, the better it gets. So uh, if you think about open source, if you think about all the other things, that's exactly what happens is we are trading things. We, we want to work as a larger community as possible. What we have to offer, what we can trade. There are a few things. There is baseline. It may not be exactly an OSGI core thing, but there is a, um, a, an enormous uh, amount of people out there that are struggling with versioning things and measuring like how, uh, which version match to which version. And we're pretty good at semantic versioning and we're pretty good at things like baselining and comparing things. What if we could not limit that thing to OSGI, but actually, expand the thing, even beyond Java if we could, and give that to people. They would much appreciate it. Resolver is another thing. I, I mean, Resolver is a great thing, <coughs> but it's OSGI. It's like you kind of move, you have to like shift people into OSGI world and then they could benefit from the Resolver. What if there was a way to actually get the concepts of the Resolver and fix Maven Central? I mean, I understand Maven Center is huge and there's a little crap in there and probably not, uh, not something that we want to go tomorrow, but I don't see any efforts in, in trying to investigate and try to say, okay, maybe make, I mean, there was a period of time when there was no Maven Central. Then it show up, everyone's using it. Maybe it's time for the next thing, but it doesn't have to be limited to OSGI because as long as it is, it's only us, the community, that is interested in it. If we could provide benefits for everyone in the Java world or even beyond Java world, then actually it, it may be much worth doing it than, 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 than now. Service registry. I mean, look into, into all those uh, uh, new technologies with like Docker and microservices and, and, and then all the Netflix stuff that is popping up. They are dealing with discovery things all over the place. And we've been dealing with this for like decades, right? Why not get the know-how and, and actually help those guys with their technology stacks to do service discovery? I mean, okay, I, you will argue that service registry gives you an instance, I say you cannot give an instance of a Docker, it's Java specific, but I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the dynamics, about the things that come and go, uh, and about notifications and all those things. I mean. Honestly, if I knew how to you know, implement it, I would, but it's just an idea and, and maybe worth, uh, worth uh, considering. Next thing is software design principles. Um, we do have a lot of those, but then again, we are limiting those to Java. Uh, and to, uh, sorry, to, to OSGI is basically say, uh, you have to do this because the framework enforces such limitations on you. And then they say, well, forget the framework, I don't want these limitations. What if, if we turn around and say, you know, doing these things is just good design? You know, you could do this with or without OSGI. You know, do, I, I, I have another talk about microservices and modularity where I take um, a Java Enterprise Glassfish application, I modularize it, I build microservices, Spring Boot microservices out of it, then OSG fight, o, o, then change the, bond, uh, the, the jar files to be OSGI uh, uh, bundles, and then uh, you know, run that in Felix, and then run that in Lightray. It's all doable, and I don't tell them, hey, you know what, if you want to have this, you have to use OSGI. Basically, what I try to tell them is, Think architecture, design your architecture, think modular, uh, and OSGI is a, uh, a, a much easier to do if you do so. 
developers struggle for guidelines, especially if you consider how many young people are in the industry today. They struggle for guidelines. They struggle for someone to tell them, do this and you'll be cool, right? That is why things like the 12-factor app, if you're familiar with, are so popular. Uh, people just go with 12 points, like, oh, this is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do, this is how you build your application, you're good to go. And they love these things. What they don't like is specs. And you're probably aware of what happened with the Java EE thing and the micro profile, and I don't really want to go into the politics because there's a lot of politics involved in that. But the point is, the bunch companies got together and said, you know what? Forget about specs. Let's get this API, these frameworks that, are actually, that actually make sense for what we do and, and just put them out together and, and just take care of that. And people were like, wow, Java Guardians have like whatever fans uh, out there because that's a simplification. You don't need the whole specs. You just need these 5, 10, whatever things that makes your life easier. Um, this is a recording of today of what is called a Spring Initializer. Uh, you can just go there and click the technologies that you want to use in your Spring Boot, so that's like JPA, whatever, or you can unfold the whole thing and scroll through a bunch of things that are available uh, for you to use. So you could just say, I want a Twitter, I want a Facebook, or, or I want a Neo4j, or whatever and click on the generate thing, and it is either going to generate for you a Maven build or a Gradle build with a specific version. How simple is that? Why don't we have that? I mean, there is a, no technical limitation for us to actually have that. We have similar things. We have features in, in, in the Caraf project that you kind of group functionality together, and so instead of installing 15 bundles, you can just say install, I don't know, CXF, and it's going to you know, install the whole thing for you. We have things like uh, uh, Amdatu Bootstrap, uh, which is kind of like this, but it's heavily tied to, uh, to BND tools. Um, so attempts have been done, but there is nothing that then we can share the world and say, hey, you know what, that's actually a cool thing to do. Um, that's CoreOS. CoreOS, if you're not familiar with it, it's an operating system for, uh, uh, for the cloud, and the package manager is uh, um, a Docker. Basically, it runs Docker containers. Um, and then they have, uh, they use, for example, ECD. So every time uh, you create, you put a new uh, operating system, uh, a, a new uh, core OS, it joins automatically with the cluster. So you treat the whole cluster as a, like one operating system. Then you have the thing called fleet that actually you can tell, like, okay, start me this service on any node with these tags and blah, blah, blah. And people love these things. Hey, remember the presentation from 2004? We wanted to have a OSGI to be like an operating system. What, what prevents us from doing this? I mean, we could have something like this, that you could have a, like a, a, a runtime with, with OSGI in it, and then you just deploy a jar file with the services in it, and then you can use some mapping to say, oh, well, deploy this service on any node that has these tags or whatever. And yes, I'm aware we have commercial solutions that are closer to that, but we don't have anything open source, anything that we can collaborate on, uh, that we can actually move to the next level. And it's, it's perfectly doable. And if you think about it, uh, what we need is a kind of a combination of core OS and Android. Because Android is the, the, the exact same thing happened. They got the Linux, they got Java on top of it, and everyone's happy using it. Well, just they don't have the distributed part, which what CoreOS does. Well, in my presentation about uh, modularity, uh, I tried to explain to people why in OSGI we use import and export packages. And I used a picture like this. There's a factory, and factory produces things for you. So in the real life, you don't care about the factory. You care about the things. It may be a different factory that produces those things, right? So this goes to more generic approach. There's an entity, an entity has something to offer to you. You don't care about the entity. You don't want to depend on the entity. You want to get what it has to offer to you. 
And in application, in particular, in your application, you have an artifact. But you don't want to depend on the artifact. You want to depend on what art, like you want to import what the artifact exports to you, what it gives you. That's what you care about, not the artifact itself. So I'll bring this one more le one level up. People don't want to depend on OSGI. They just want to import the good things that OSGI exports. So let's make that happen, and we're going to see a lot, a lot more appreciation for the technology that we all use. Thank you. I don't think we have a time for a question. Go ahead. So I know it's called an outsider's view, but I also know that LifeRay are an OSGI board member. I was just wondering if this is a presentation that you shared with the OSGI board? Uh, nope. Not yet. Not yet, but there's a plan? Mm, I mean, I know that at least one of the OSGI board members will see it. <laughs> would, would that be the LifeRay board member? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not going to try to either confirm or, or, or um, like uh, prove you wrong. I think there is a fair share in, 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 in that opinion. Um, from my own perspective, my personal perspective, I was more in that mindset a couple of years ago than I am now. Uh, and that is not because Life Ray is a member of, uh, of the Alliance, but because I actually see things changing. I see people who used to be more in a mindset of like, uh, if you don't know this, you're ignorant or stupid. Uh, uh, now being more helpful and, and trying to understand that there are other views. Um, it's probably far from perfect, but I see an improvement personally. And uh, that presentation is uh, something totally new. None of the, the people in the, in the OSGI Alliance have seen it, but uh, the views expressed in that uh, presentation I've brought up uh, many, many times. And I know uh, for a fact that some of them have reached the, the right people. Um, obviously, I don't know how influenced they were about that or you know, they may just think I'm ignorant or stupid or, or evil. Um, uh, but th that's my kind of, uh, that's the only thing I can do. I can raise concerns. I can say those are the things I see. Those are the things people can tell me. And uh, then someone will either trust me, that's the truth, and, uh, and do its own research and try to f figure out a way to solve the problem or at least improve the situation or they're just going to ignore it. I mean, that's so much I can do. I hope you'll come to the boss tonight. We would love to hear some of your comments from the boss. I will. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. In your opinion, the best way to solve the shaded bundle problem is to recycle and use in OSGI, normal SGI replica. Because I spent, for instance, a couple of days drafting Spark in OSGI, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I finally managed to, to find a solution, but you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of a monster. So what, what is the correct approach to solve this? Long term or short term? <laughs> well, both, maybe. I'm interested. I mean, long term, there is one solution. Uh, honestly, there is one solution. You can't, I mean, short term, you can maintain someone else's code. But long term, you can't do that. I, I had a discussion with Vadin guys. I'm sure if you're familiar with the, the, the Vadin uh, project. It's quite an interesting project. And they do have an OSGI um, uh, kind of uh, support OSGI. So for a personal project of mine, I wanted to use Vadin. And then it kind of brought like a pile of dependencies on it, including a custom guava uh, jar, which they maintain in their own Maven repo. And I was like, 
Okay, so I met them and I was like, why do you do that? They said, well, because we need guava and we cannot get, you know, obviously Google to, to, to produce a, uh, a, a bundle. And, and, and so, so we just created our own version. It's like, so what happens when they release the next one? Well, we, we kind of make another one. Um, then I was like, curious. So I got their source code and start, you know, searching, do a search through their source code and how many places they use guava. So I don't want to lie about the numbers right now, but I think it was like four classes and like 16 usages of Guava methods in the whole code base of them, right? And then you think, do I really need Guava? I mean, come on. But, but so to answer your question is, long term, we need to get those people interested into, uh, into maintaining a proper artifact. I'm curious to what extent Java 9 will help here, because Java 9 is going to push a lot of people to do modules and, and uh, isolation of things and so forth. So once they have to do it for Java 9, it's just one step further to actually do it for SGI. So maybe that's going to help. Short term, I don't have the answer. You have to figure it out. Either get rid of the dependency, uh, or you have to maintain it yourself, or you have to be powerful enough to convince the maintainer of that dependency to, to, to change it. But long term, I think this problem is solvable. We just need to get these people to acknowledge the fact that there is another technology uh, that people want to use. Uh, and if it is limiting uh, a, a significant amount of people, they will be actually willing to do it and if it does not impose a great cost. On, uh, like if, we could, if we could have a, a prototype of, let's say, I don't know, an X amount of, of, of Maven artifacts, I don't know what's a good amount, let's say 1,000 or 5,000, 10,000, whatever. I, I'm just making up the numbers here. But if we could get a good example of that and just say, hey, here is uh, OSGI Maven Central, whatever you want to call it, with like OSG5 bundles and so forth, and people start using that, and we continuously add only you know, good stuff into it, and it proves useful. That's gonna be a motivation for more people to want to do it. If you have a code, if you have a product that's used by, I don't know, millions of developers, and hundreds of them complain about OSGI, you would probably say, uh, you know, it's, it's not worth the effort, right? So, Long term, we need, to, we need to get the technology to the point where it's relevant to enough people that they can make an impact. Yeah. I mean, because people did try what you're suggesting before. There was a thing called the Spring Source Enterprise Bundle Repository, yeah. and they spent a lot of time and a lot of money doing exactly what you just said, and it ended up being not used because it never had the latest version of Library Y that people wanted. Agree, and that's why it cannot be manual work. That's why it has to be automated. That's why it has to happen on the fly. Well, you can't, you know, come on, let's get one thing straight. Uh, speaking about Maven Central and quality, you never get that. I mean, you don't know. People release all crazy things about it. It's, it's, a, it's a responsibility. The quality is a responsibility of a maintainer and not of the, uh, uh, not of the, the, the repo uh, owner, right? So I, I never treat Maven as a, like, uh, oh, well, that's high quality uh, a, a repo. I'm, I'm like always, um, checking with the, uh, with the, uh, the exact uh, maintainer of the given library. Uh, that said, I understand the beginning. If we were to do it tomorrow, let's say we figure out an, a script that can automate the process, the day after tomorrow, it would be nightmare, 
I totally agree with you. It's going to be like awful. It's going to be bloated with assumptions, uh, uh, which are most of them would be probably wrong. But if it is an automated thing, and or a rule based, so that you can improve the rules and then just rebuild and rebuild and add and whatever, within a given period of time, it should be it should improve to the point where it is useful. If you think about it, that's what happened to Docker Hub. When Docker Hub started first, you, you got a, a, a Java image or whatever image, which was like four gigabyte, right? And with the time, they figured out that they can use Alpine, they can use this, they can use that, and they actually reduce it and, and give you a, a meaningful size image. Uh, it didn't happen the first day, but it didn't stop them from trying to do it. So I'm, I'm not saying it is the solution. I mean, guys, don't get me wrong. If, if I was the person who knows the solution to the problem, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you talking about the problem, but I would be demoing my $5 million uh, you know, framework or, or whatever. Uh, right? It's not that the solution is out there and we're just going to reach for it and next day we all go home happy. But my message is, Realize we have a problem and let us all together try to solve it somehow because as long as we try to solve it each and every own um, like backyard, this is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. If, you, if, if each of us tries on, our, on their own, it's not going to happen. It's only going to happen if we all try together. That's basically what I wanted to tell you. More questions? Oh, ah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'll be around for the next two days as well. So today and the next two days. So find me, talk to me anytime.